Welcome to What Are You Sporting About podcast, a podcast about business, employment, sports, and entertainment to help educate, support, and guide you to your next level. Here's your host, attorney Savania DeBarros. Hi, everybody. It is Savani DeBarros, protector of athletes, also the founder and principal attorney of the SL DeBarros Law Firm, where we represent six and seven figure business owners and athletes in business. It is my pleasure to be sitting here with Mr. Harry Swain. Let me just introduce him really quickly for you guys so you have some context of who we're dealing with today, right? So Mr. Swain attended Rutgers University. He received his BS in sports management. And he received numerous Big East honors and was drafted by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the seventh round of the 1987 NFL draft. But after playing defensive line for three years, he made a difficult switch in 1990 to left defensive tackle where he would play for 12 years in the league. I mean, that's amazing. Um, He spent 15 years in the league and a total of 12 years in HR. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Swain. Hey, Savannah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about being on this show. You are. It's a pleasure to have you here and you're definitely welcome. I want to know, though, what what made you interested in the HR industry, especially as a former professional athlete? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you would think that that wouldn't be like the natural progression, right? Right. From a, a gridiron lineman. Right. And I played a little dirty, I think. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I was always concerned about uh, my players uh, and their needs, especially off the field, right? So it was a natural. Pro- it wasn't. Uh, it was a natural progression for me to go from playing in the National Football League to becoming a team chaplain for the Chicago Bears, and then uh, player development, player engagement, HR with uh, the Ravens. It really was. I mean, I've been caring for players since the day I got in the locker room, and a player cared for me. That's deep, um, because when we look at a lot of these institutions and organizations, and if, especially if we're dealing with sports where the majority of the athletes are African-American or Latino or some other race than uh, the Caucasian race, you want to make sure that the leadership reflects that, that they understand the development from for the player and development can mean different things, right? Mm-hmm. So as an HR representative, how have you taken the word development and, and allowed that to help the people who serve under you or who report to you so that they, they develop into the professionals that um, that can show up to work and be productive, but also in their personal lives, they can advance? Yeah. yeah. Um, a great question. Yeah, I realized I worked for a football team and that their uh, number one aim was to win games, right? Uh, just my part in winning the games uh, really came down to uh, having employees that uh, that had enough uh, character uh, to uh, take ownership of their performance. Because if the empl- employer was taking ownership of their empl- em- performance, it just would not work. We would not have much access to our employees out on the field, right? But when the employees uh, take ownership because they have a level of character or a football character, if you call it, or athletic character, uh, whatever you want to tag it with, right? Uh, Then we win games before we even start the game. That's deep. We win games before we even start the game. And so it's a it's a huge mental component. It's a huge mindset component. Um, yeah. And of course, there are a lot of people now who are who are diving deep into the mental aspect of the athlete and especially in the context of uh, student athletes. Mm-hmm. So my question for you is, why is the mindset of the minority D1 student athletes largely focused on becoming a professional athlete? Yeah. Especially yeah. because you have, it's such a very small window yeah. for college athletes to come to become pro. Yeah. So yeah. is their mindset stuck on 
technically winning that particular level of professionalism versus something else that could possibly make them more successful in life than the sport itself. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you on that. I mean, if you just look at the data, right, uh, less than 1% of D1 athletes will have the opportunity to go pro, right? And even of that small, less than 1%, uh, they'll show up at the team, uh, but they'll only be there for three months, right? Uh, or three years, uh, which, uh, which means they won't get any benefits, uh, just the pay that they receive, right? And so, uh, in many ways, uh, we sold that lie to them uh, to get them to the D1 school and, and to begin with, right? And it was people that were twice the age of the student athlete uh, that sold on that bill of goods, right? For them to get sorely disappointed uh, when they leave that four-year institution and they're not even close to becoming a professional athlete uh, to even have the talent to uh, be uh, a possibility. So I recently spoke on a panel where you attended this event and we were talking about self-identity of the student athlete. And to many people's amazement, there are a lot of athletes who don't know their own self-identity. They don't, they don't know who they are outside of sports. They don't know what their self-worth is outside of sports. Um, are the parents, are the coaches, are the leaders at these universities, are they going wrong somewhere? I mean, what are the mistakes that are being made? Is this an, an HR nightmare? I mean, using your background and experience, you know, what is happening that is, is putting these student athletes on, I guess we can kind of say like a mental, a path to mental destruction where they don't even know who they are themselves. Yeah, I mean, this is a society issue, right? It's not even just the student athletes, but certainly them because student athletes should not be struggling with who they are, right? The fact that student athletes do struggle with that says more about the adults who are culpable for the development as a fully functioning adult member of society, right? I mean, think about all the number of, of, of adults who have dragged their kids to every practice, every game, every sport so that the kid is forced to see themselves through performance and then we wonder why they don't know who they are when they can't perform on a field or a court anymore right and now they're 18 years old going to a four-year institution and we think they're going to get it there no so we have performers not people and whoa performers Performers cannot know who they are outside of their performance, right? Wow, so do you think this is more so like, you know how an actor or an actress, they put, in, they put on their costume or they step into their, their role when they hit the set. But the difference with an actor and actress is when they step into the set, and they step into that that mind frame of the person that they're playing, they can step out of that role. But essentially for an athlete or someone who's been pushing performances yep. um, their entire lifetime, they've gotten stuck within the act yeah. and yeah. don't have a, a, a an outward view of who they are themselves because they've been stuck in that one particular role for too long. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great way to put it. I love the illustration, uh, Savania, and um, yeah, it's horrible, right? And uh, so, uh, you know, I've I'm met with all of these student athletes. Most of them that I meet are have talent for the professional ranks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I see all the gaps in their personhood development. We'll call it that, right? And I know that in order for them to be a professional, they'll have to handle life along with the ups and downs of their performance, especially uh, you realize this, the best, we get the best this country has on a gridiron and then they get to the professional ranks and they get beat and disappointed mercilessly and they have to deal with failure. If they haven't had any practice at dealing with failure, 
uh, then their character has to support, uh, right, that challenge, that difficulty, or what men hate to call exposure, <laughs> mm. right? Deep. But that's what the National Football League does, is it exposes all weaknesses. Inevitably, what happens is uh, sport will uh, expose some of your character gaps, <laughs> right? And uh, this is work that should be done before they even got to the professional ranks, certainly uh, reminded of at the college ranks. And some college programs do a great job at doing it. Many coaches do a great job at doing it. Basically, what coaches and colleges are left to do is the stuff that the parents should have done. Right, when they were much more uh, formative. Right, that's, so. That's a whole sermon right there. Yeah. Um, professional sports will expose your character gaps. So this reminds me of some research that I was doing for a different project, but I ran across this individual's dissertation um, for education. And this study was about the level of resilience based on individual students from the age of five to 18 who had participated in sports. And what they found was the answers that were that were received showed a higher level of resiliency from um, in the students who were athletes or participated in some types of sports versus those who did not. So then it, it brings me to the, the question, is resiliency just being shown in the aspect of the ability to perform, the ability to show up, the ability to work through pain. But is there something that's suffering behind, you know, that that window, that wall of resiliency when we start looking at the character of the individual outside of sports? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think in many ways uh, playing the sport uh, really uncovers the deposits that that student athlete already has in them, right? And so the sport actually gives it a place to demonstrate itself, right? Uh, it actually gives it place, not just resiliency, but but grit and self-discipline and passion, right? And those types of things, and a love for what it is that I'm doing, whatever ball game it is, or whatever activity it, it is, those types of things actually uh, are the grip by which we see who this person is, a resilient young man or a resilient young woman, full of grit, passion, desire, drive, and will, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, and then as we go and as we grow, when we over identify with the grip that shows who we are, it gets flipped somewhere and we become what we do, right? And that dictates who we are. And then what we do ends, and now we have to figure out who the heck am I after all? Wow, wow. So, and, and I see the illustration how you can get lost. You get lost in the whole process. Um, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes it's, it's, it's not, this is not an issue that's only germane to athletes, right? No. These are individuals um, who may have done something for years and years, and, yep. you know, they worked hard. They thought this was the track that they wanted. Uh, yep. Like you said, they became the thing that they, that they do and got lost in it. Mm -hmm. And now you're mm -hmm. having to reorganize who you are as a person. That's, yep. that's deep. That's really, really deep. Uh -huh. that, yeah. I mean, yeah. think about it, uh, Savonia. If um, I know a guy that's an incredible uh, neurosurgeon, right? Uh, he's been practicing uh, in that field for many years, right? Intricate, delicate surgeries, right? Uh, he suffered an injury and can no longer be a neurosurgeon. Extremely bright, learned guy. He's struggling with his transition, right? having to uh, reorient himself with all of the talents and traits and characteristics that he had expressed uh, in, a, uh, in brain surgery, uh, now having to learn and do a new craft, right? He's much older than uh, the uh, typical retired NFL athlete or professional athlete, uh, right? But uh, 
the challenge and the adversity that he's faced because of this transition is causing a crisis in his life. No different than a 20 something year old whose college career is over and they'll no longer pick up a ball. And that's why it's important to still do things that you love outside of work. You know, for as long as I can remember, I've always been multifaceted or had multiple talents. And I remember my grandmother, who's now she's gone from this this earth, but she used to tell me, baby, you got too many eyes in the fire at once. But I just I was so excited about my gifts. I just felt like I didn't have the time to let one sit on the side and then start working on another one. And so I really understood kind of what she was saying, like you need to focus focus on one thing first and then start something else so that you can develop it out properly. But what I'm realizing, aside from my love for sports, because I always wanted to be an Olympic track athlete, that did that didn't happen, right? Uh -huh. But all the other things that I dreamed about doing, they are coming to fruition because I never, I never abandoned those things. I may have paused for a moment to develop something else, but I never I never completely abandoned them and they're starting to make, you know, to come to life. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's going to be important for a lot of a lot of people, a lot of athletes, especially people who have gotten lost, like we said, in the process of always performing, but not really knowing who they are, not really knowing what it is that they enjoy doing. Yeah. Right. You got to have something that you lose yourself in outside of work, because yeah. whether you get paid to play a sport or not, you're going to work. When you show up to practice, maybe you are working. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? Back in the day in the 70s, we called them hobbies. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, those are important. Like that really makes uh, for a well-rounded person. Uh, right. Parents that expose their kids to different things. Right. Uh, even in our training for our particular sport, uh, I'll participate in other sports or other activities, uh, seemingly unrelated to my particular expertise, right? It helps my brain uh, to even uh, refine itself and grow uh, even within my expertise, right? Um, I was a big skater before uh, I played football. So I was all over Philadelphia winning trophies at all the local public rec centers uh, and figure skating, right? I love figure skating, but I really love the trophies, <laughs> right? Uh, but what I really love was how people reacted to the trophies that they saw, right? Because I love that level of affirmation, right? Especially from men, right? I grew up single mom, she worked her butt off uh, and uh, provided for me and my sister. I, I didn't know that figure skating would be teased <laughs> when my when my the guys in my neighborhood saw me with my ice skates slung over my shoulder one day, right? And so, uh, but I then found out when I played football uh, how much that new environment and those different people served me uh, when it came to relating to people off of a football field away from that particular workplace, right? Uh, different mindset, uh, same grit, same determination, same resilience, same passion, right? Uh, even though I had a lot of passion, I still wasn't very good at a triple toe loop. <laughs> I used to love, oh my gosh, like when I was a kid, you brought back some beautiful memories. I used to sit in the floor just watching these figure skaters. It was amazing. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe you used to do that. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I get teased all the time. So if somebody hears this, you know, they'll blow me up. That's okay. I'm used to it. But it shows your versatility, which is amazing. I mean, if you continue living, you have to be versatile because not everything is always going to be provided to you in this beautiful, perfect box, yeah. you know, you're going to have to take chances and step outside of that and do some things that are out of your norm. But the fact that, I mean, you're really <laughs> an all around athlete for real. If you can go from figure skating to football, yeah. that is totally different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally different. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But I want to ask you something because we, when we talk about self-worth, um, sometimes a lot of people also think about confidence. 
Yes. And he said you liked you liked having the trophies because the trophies provided affirmation. Do you think I mean, was this a confidence issue that you that you were having back then as a, a, a young male or was oh, it just something that patted you on the shoulder, say, you know, good job. And, and you just like that, like. Having okay. it. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah. I mean, uh, we I mean, we're, we're born to uh, be connected, to live in community with each other. Right. Uh, and we all need to hear from the community in which we live together. Right. Uh, that's just part of our DNA. More specifically, uh, hearing uh, good things from, particularly for me, men was huge, right? I think my mom even knew at like age of 13 that she needed some help finishing off my maturity, uh, right? There were some parts that she knew that she just, her voice wasn't good enough anymore, right? And so she actually was the one to get me involved in sports because it would put me around some men who could keep eyes on me and uh, ascertain how I was doing, right? Give me uh, an affirmative evaluation that would spur me on to try and be challenged and do better and more. And that's huge. It's a huge, huge part of my development. That same thing kept happening in the NFL for me because there were two veteran players who I intentionally uh, chose as mentors, and they were more than willing uh, to help me out. Back then in the 80s, you needed to have some help in order to make a team. And uh, these two men just happened to be more than willing to do it. I still talk to them today. And so, uh, I mean, we are, we, I mean, think about it. Our best help comes from the people that are closest to us in our group, in our office, in our department, uh, whatever the case may be, they are in a position to not just help us, but also to help us grow. I literally had a conversation about mentorship <clears throat> not too long ago and how people overlook individuals that are right in their life who are mentors, but we, yeah. we don't think to give them that title. We think we got to search for something that is shiny and, yeah. you know, come with all the accolades and really you don't, mm -hmm. you really, really don't. But yeah. I do want to ask you because you said professional sports will expose your character gaps. But one yeah. thing that your mother knew to do was to put you in an environment where you can you can really get um, male guidance, yep. you know, yeah. men who can teach you how to be a young man and a, a man, um, how to be a professional, you know. Do you yeah. think that's what a lot of our kids are missing these days, especially if we're, we're talking about the black and brown communities? Absolutely. Is, is that where those character gaps are coming from? Uh, yeah, a big part of uh, how we learn, especially in the African-American community, Character characteristically, uh, our knowledge is more caught than taught. Right. So I figured out how to be a man by watching men uh, lovingly respond to women. Right? I figured out how to handle my money. Uh, but watching men save their money and not spend it on that thing that they really wanted. I learned restraint that way, right? I learned uh, the value of delayed gratification. Just because I could doesn't mean I should, right? And so, yeah, I learned quite a bit. I just picked the right men, right? <laughs> My mom taught me how to pick the right person, right? What to look for. And then she sent me off. She sent me away. Right. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's how it works. That's the best way for it to work. And so that's this this element is really what set my programming with the Ravens apart, because every rookie from Joe Flacco's class in 2008 to 18 had another veteran mentor him throughout the season. Right. We just happen to have some quality men with the Ravens that afforded us the ability to do that. Right. So we would uh, propagate and continue to build into men uh, all of the treasure that they inherently had. It just needed to be called out by another man who was already where they wanted to be. Wow. The 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 major point that you pulled out of that is the fact that you had discernment. And I think a lot of a lot of our kids are lacking discernment because what we see a lot, <clears throat> and I, I literally was just reading this book the other day talking about 
entitlement and how people see the extraordinary. You know, everybody wants the extraordinary. No one wants to be average. No one wants to just understand who they are. They got to have the extra, extra, extra. And a lot of our kids are missing the discernment to choose the right mentor because they want their mentors to have the extra. And Mm -hmm. sometimes they they just might not be the right matchup for you. Mm -hmm. Right. They may not be able to give you the right guidance. So I love the fact that you you were able to discern who were the right people to help guide you down the path where you wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not and it's not hard nowadays. I mean, the number one quality we needed in our mentors was for them to be coachable. You know, or you can use teachable, either one. Right. Because we knew if the mentor was coachable and teachable, we knew that they would receive uh, from us right? Uh, some tips, some advice, and some counsel, right? So we would pour into them. They would pour into the uh, younger man, right? And so we would be, be able to uh, recreate and establish uh, a standard, a level of operating procedure, right? For all persons, right? right? In this cauldron, uh, uh, this is the setting by which uh, uh, com- competition can really uh, take place when men really sharpen men, right? It works better that way than us trying to establish it off of the performance on the football field, right? That we would establish those uh, standards of operating and relating and connecting and communicating and uh, uh, creating a standard by which we are all accountable for the things that we are culpable for, right? It starts there. Those sons, husbands, fathers play a game at a different level for each other that way, right? And so really at the end of the day, like uh, we just really begged, borrowed and stole from another institution that's much older than ours, family. So those things already happen in a healthy, thriving family, right? And so we just created a version of family in a workplace. Right. To the degree that that employee did not have family or had a version of a family uh, was the reason for the mentors, because they could get much more personal and applicable than we could speak in their language. Like I don't speak the language of the millennial. I certainly don't speak the language of the Gen Zer, but they do. (laughs) Right. And so they teach me. It goes both ways. And so uh, and yeah, and that's. Uh, That is really how uh, we learn and grow and teach and reach and uh, run full speed uh, into uh, our future uh, and and really take advantage of the short present that we have, especially in the pro ranks. Yeah. Men sharpen men was your statement. It reminded me of my mentor, who's a black male professional Uh lawyer. Very yeah. successful, and he would always tell me, "Iron sharpens iron." Yeah, you know, one thing I love about my mentor is number one, he keeps it real, like mm-hmm. all the way real. <laughs> <laughs> but he he treats me as an equal. You know, yeah. he calls me, and we I'm a lawyer as well, so we can sit on the phone and we can talk law for hours. You know, literally the other day we were on the phone for about two hours. I was like, dude, I gotta go, I gotta work, but. I love the fact that he respects me enough to ask me things. Mm -hmm. And when he does, we can go back and forth. And and that's where his statement, it makes the most sense to me. Iron does sharpen iron. And in your context, men sharpen men, Mm -hmm. because if we want to create leaders, you know, those who don't have those those character gaps, those who can um, perform on the field of court and in life and in the profession, you know, we need people who are willing to step up to the plate and, um, you know, exhibit the same type of character traits that we want our yeah. young yeah. men and women to exhibit. Yeah. 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 So I want to shift gears a little bit um, because we we have seen an ent- a huge push for social justice. I mean, for someone like you and me, social justice issues have always been, <laughs> you know, <laughs> matters that need attention. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Um, but with the onset of the coronavirus, I think that was a a perfect storm to make people listen. And so Mm -hmm. you have a lot of institutions who 
are paying attention, but also taking action. And one thing I, I want to talk to you about are the predominantly white women soccer players mm -hmm. at the University of Delaware. Yes. Right. Um, why do you think they weren't satisfied with just demonstrating for social justice? Yeah, uh, I really think it was because they were kind of fed up with uh, not having the confidence, right, uh, to go on the other side of the locker room or on the other side of the campus or in the city not too far away from University of Delaware, Philadelphia, and have a conversation with somebody that looked different from them, had a different skin color. They were fed up with not having uh, the confidence to uh, cross over the tracks, right? And so raising the sign or taking a knee was not good enough uh, for these uh, young white women at the University of Delaware. That's really why I think uh, they, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's something. You know, we've seen a lot of, especially our professional teams, their uniforms, have social justice um, activist type language. Um, we've seen independent athletes, uh, like for instance, in tennis, mm -hmm. you know, wearing, showing, you know, names of individuals who've been killed or impacted by social injustices on their masks. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had athletes who have set out of their seasons to protest and to be activists, to raise awareness to social justice matters. Um, do you think there will be more of this? And do you think that we will have more of our white athletes, women and men to step into those ranks and to join arms with us? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, this, this women's soccer team at University of Delaware was a great example, right? Uh, athletes, teammates, anybody in like a close knit community, right? Uh, they are empowered by one another, right? And so these uh, young white women could, uh, to, they were really empowered to uh, take a risk because the risk here, you got to understand the culture and we live in this culture where you have to be right. You have to say it right. You cannot make a mistake. Uh, you cannot post the wrong thing. You'll get cult, you'll get canceled and you get one chance, right? Why we expect 18, 19 and 20 year olds to not make mistakes is beyond me, right? Matter of fact, I encourage uh, young people to make every new mistake they can think of. Right, go ahead, make the mistake, right? I don't want them to be held back from having to deal with the pain of making a mistake or failing at something, right? There's absolutely no way uh, that a white person would understand my black experience, right? <laughs> right? I love it when they wanna find out, right? Even when they ask uh, the question the wrong way, right? Like I have uh, white friends, we were talking about uh, uh, the protest and the marches. I was using the language protest, march, protest, march. They were using the language riot, riot. And so I just very matter of factly in the course of the conversation unemotionally, uh, hey Bob, I've noticed you've been using the word riot. You do know that uh, riots, they uh, throw and damage stuff, but in large part, all the protests have been peaceful. That's why we call them marches and protests. It's like, I never thought about that. It's like, yeah, because you don't want to communicate, you know, something that's not true, <laughs> right? But yeah. I can understand why some other people would, you know, consider it a riot. <laughs> yeah. Right? So this is a simple uh, thing to think about that wouldn't occur to him, but to us uh, really does stand out, right? And and again, it circles back to that mind, you know, how you perceive things as an individual. And a lot of that we perceive things differently in large part because of the communities that we come from, <clears throat> you know. Right. And so for um, an individual from the African-American community, when we see things, it's it's from a different lens of 
really trying to uh, use our voice differently or mm -hmm. louder so that people can hear that something needs to happen. And I agree with you, especially with our white counterparts and athletes who are getting involved, they shouldn't be penalized for um, uh, stepping up for what is right, mm -hmm. you know, stepping up for a change. And that's one thing I love about this newer generation is because they don't care yep. <laughs> yep. what their grandfathers and grandmothers thought. They they don't yep. care. And they're more, they're more immersed into culture now. They're yep. more immersed. They, they have more friends that are different races and come from different backgrounds yep. than yep. what, you know, their grandparents came from. Yep. You know, albeit yep. we do have some people who may live in predominantly white states or communities, but if they go off to college, you yep. are bound to run into somebody who looks different from you. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I would say my culture was more uh, profits over purpose. This culture now, they're more purpose over profits, right? My folks would stay at one job for 30 years. Uh, this culture, it's a gig economy, right? They won't, they'll work here for a few days, do a project here, a project there, four, five, six streams of income, they really want to stay on the path where they change the world. I love it. Change it, right? Yes. And student athletes have an advantage here because they're forced to, on a team, uh, see their differences in a different light because they've seen the commitment that they've shared together on this one common cause, win a stupid game. That one common cause eradicated all differences on many teams, right? Right. So the yeah. same thing that happened in the University of Delaware happened in Baltimore when Freddie Gray hit. Uh, our players wanted to do something. They would not be uh, convinced to just give money, right? Right. They, they had to have a conversation because not all 70 players wanted to do the same thing. So we had to have our version of a town hall. And uh, and it was great. We got to talk about a lot of the issues and we only had one rule in that town hall is that after uh, six minutes, if we don't hear from the white voices in the room, we got to shut it down because we need to hear from them. And so we had to put up with the uh, very uncomfortable dead silence in a room filled with 80 men <laughs> for one brave white guy to speak up, All right? And uh, they actually uh, shared and asked questions more than the black guys did. And so by the time my town hall was done, we knew exactly what we wanted to do, where we wanted to go in Baltimore, how we wanted to give back, and uh, the purposeful message that we wanted to send. No security, no media. It, this was for us, for our community. Right? Yeah. And so it's a little scary because we go into Baltimore, they hadn't quite cleaned up. And we went to the places that uh, needed the most help, which meant uh, it was a little dangerous. <laughs> but but we we used our Ravens card that we would make things neutral. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> sometimes you got to use your sometimes you got to use your card now. <laughs> hey, use the right? card. Use right? your card. Yeah. But that that's an example of how athletes have an advantage over the rest of society. Uh, because not only uh, is another uh, ethnic background our neighbor, uh, we are committed to this one common cause, right? That requires so much of us physically, emotionally, and mentally. We just get to see the real person uh, outside of just the work that they do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If our country could see uh, their persons in their neighborhood that way, uh, we would absolutely er eradicate racism. I agree. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And, and I love the fact, though, that, um, you know, you all did this town hall presentation so that your athletes understand and have the form to pose the questions that they need to have answered for greater awareness and understanding, because honestly, that's where a lot of things can be changed is through the level of education, yep. right? It's impossible it. to change anything if you're ignorant as to what is happening around you. Yep. That's how change happens in this country. Correct. Pro protest, 
town hall, new policy gets signed. That's how it goes. Protest is uh, forcing government elected officials to hear from voices that you need to hear from, right? That's, the, that's protest. Then you get a meeting with them at the local level. That's the town hall, right? From that, those local officials, uh, then policy, new policy, new laws, new regulations are put into place that reflect the needs uh, of the people. That's how things are done. Man, I mean, that's just, that's amazing. That's amazing. And I just want to just let everybody know if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, it is possible to to literally change the world. I, yes. I believe that it is because, you know, when you, like you said, we have a culture now of purpose over profits. And when people who are so brazen in their purpose take, you know, that one step to do something amazing, it latches on to other people and you're not alone. And so in that respect, other people now join you in your purpose and that will help you change the world. So I, I do truly believe that um, we will we will definitely have social freedom, social equity, social justice that is a, a level playing field for everybody. I don't know when, but I know <laughs> it's coming. Yes, I know it's coming. coming. Yes. Yeah. They hope. Yeah. So I am so I'm just so happy that you were able to join me today. I do want to ask you though, if there's any advice that you have for our listeners or viewers, people who may be watching this now or later, um, go ahead and, and drop your bars. Yeah, I think, uh, Savoni, I think the, the one thing I want to tell your, your viewers, your, your audience, is that everybody has a treasure deposited in them, right? Uh, my purpose uh, is that people would discover that treasure, right? That they would fight tooth and nail over every obstacle, every distraction, uh, everything that tries to uh, convince them that they do not have that treasure, don't listen to it. Uh, keep grinding, keep digging, uh, keep chasing after that treasure that is deposited into you. That's the treasure that this world needs to see. That's the treasure that your neighborhood, your community, the society uh, needs to have uh, uh, here so that this world will be a world for all people, for everyone, every race, every color, uh, every ability, every talent. Bring your stuff and your treasure uh, out from under that rock. Uh, we need you, we need it. Uh, otherwise we cannot be us. Yes, 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 yes. I love all of that. Good. So look guys, like Mr. Swain said, everyone has a treasure deposited in them and you can tap into it. Mm. So make sure you come back for another episode of What Are You Sporting About? So you can figure out how you can do that. Again, my name is Savannah DeBarros, protector of athletes. It is my pleasure, my sincere pleasure to educate you, motivate you, and guide you to the next level. Make sure you get the book, What Are You Sporting About, so that you can be inspired to do exactly what it is that you were called to do. Again, thank you for being here. And until next time, we'll check you later. Ciao. Thanks for joining us this week on What Are You Sporting About podcast. Make sure to visit our website, prosportlawyer.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite platform is so you'll never miss a show. And while you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or iHeartRadio. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, What Are You Sporting About? Attorney Savania DeBarros is available for private consulting at S ldebarros.com. And remember, we're here to educate, support, and guide you in your journey to success because we're all sporting about something.